Too often in the United States, uh, we tend to focus on events and issues close to home while ignoring events and issues in other parts of the world. One goal of Global Fest is to help us shift that focus, at least for a moment, and pay attention to the challenges, sometimes the suffering, and always the courage of people in other parts of the world, and how what we do here may affect them in ways we don't even realize. We also seek a keynote speaker for Global Fest on such issues who can rally us to action in keeping with our Global Fest slogan, Change the World. We decided this year to focus on the global environment as our central theme. As we began searching for a speaker, we found many fine experts and advocates on subjects ranging from climate change to green technology and sustainable development. But the issue that really hit home for us, both literally and figuratively, was the role of agriculture in a sustainable future that both protects and preserves our natural environment. There are many fine institutions and groups doing some amazing work on these issues right here in our local community. Washington State University, Viva Farms, Skagit Food Co-op, just to name a few. But we wanted to bring a more global focus to these important local efforts. We quickly found that there was no one more uniquely qualified to accomplish this, nor more internationally recognized on the subject than Raj Patel. We feel very fortunate that he accepted our invitation to speak. From his early days, Working at the World Bank and the World Trade Organization, Raj discovered that there was something inherently wrong in the operation of our world food system, both in its inabilities to sustain itself over time and its awful toll on human lives, whether in the form of hunger, obesity, or injustice to the farmers who produce our food. Since then, he has been a tireless and forceful advocate for reforming that system in very fundamental and even controversial ways. But Raj does more than simply point out the system's flaws. He brings to our attention the many examples beyond our borders of grassroots efforts by people in other parts of the world, many of them victims of that system, to change that system literally from the ground up and reclaim their sovereignty over the food that sustains them. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to introduce someone who is indeed helping to change the world. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Raj Patel. Thanks very much indeed. Wide at the top is the millions, hundreds of millions of farmers around the world who grow food every day. And at the bottom, seven billion people who try to eat every day if, if we can. But in the middle, between the hundreds of millions of farmers and farm workers and the billions of consumers are just a handful of corporations. But these corporations, um, I mean, th th they are different kinds of corporations. So in, in the world gr of grain trading, for example, uh, the, the, the world's largest corporations are Archer Daniels Midland and Bungie and Cargill and Dreyfus. Uh, in the world's uh, largest soft drink market, there are two companies. The world's largest, uh, world's most widely consumed soft drink is Tea. Uh, and uh, the, the, the tea is the world's most widely consumed soft drink, and the, the two corporations that run that are Unilever and Tata. Uh, and, uh, but in, in every major market, there are just a handful of corporations that control the global food system. That, that, and when you put a few corporations in charge of mediating between farm workers and consumers, you set up some incentives uh, that, that actually are, 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 are sort of perverse if the goal is to feed everyone. Because corporations operate by some simple rules. Uh, it, the, the idea of a corporation is to return value to your shareholder. So you buy cheap and you sell dear. Right? So you, you, you pay as little as you can for, for the, your raw materials and you charge as much as you can for your, the, the stuff that you sell. So when you're buying for as little as you can, when you're, when you're buying in food products, you're paying the poorest people on the planet as little as you can. Because if you think of the people who are going hungry in the world today, the people who are the most hungry in the world today work in agriculture. The people who are starving today are people who are, work, who are farm workers, uh, usually in the global south, though farm workers in the United States have it pretty tough. Uh, and, uh, and so when you're buying cheap, you're driving down the wages of the poorest people on the planet who uh, paradoxically are working right next to the food that they cannot afford. 
At the same time, when you're, when you're selling deer, uh, as a corporation, again, you, you are in the business of, of creating, uh, you, you are under a duty, if you're head, heading a, a global corporation, a food corporation, to return, to maximize value for your shareholders, to, to uh, return as large a profit as you can. And the kind of food that is profitable is the kind of food that our bodies are hardwired to crave, food that is rich in salt and fat and sugar. And so when you, when you have these incentives aligned this way, uh, then you end up with, with this sort of paradoxical situation of corporations trying to sell uh, processed food, uh, and very profitable pro processed food on one end, and uh, paying people a pittance on the other. Uh, now, th th again, th that's a sort of structural simplification, but it, it helps set up some of the power dynamics in this system. And then you can see how they play out, because, I mean, it, back in the day, it used to be that, that uh, if you were rich, you were, uh, you, you were overweight. You know, the, the, you have the sort of idea of the fat cat. Back in the 19th century, people who were fat were wealthy, uh, and people who were, uh, were, were poor were thin. But these days, to be stuffed and starved is to actually to, to, to be at two points on a continuum of poverty. Because if you are incredibly poor, if you're not able to afford food, then you, you just you, you can't buy the food and you will go hungry. But if you are, particularly in the US or in a, a rich developed country in Europe, uh, you'll find that uh, obesity and overweight are correlated with poverty there too. In other words, if you are poor in America, and you're poor in uh, Italy, for example, um, th th you are twice as likely to be overweight in Italy if you are in the lowest uh, fifth uh, part of the income spectrum than if you're at the top fifth percent of the income spe uh, spectrum, right? And if you think about it, the, 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 think about the way, that, way it works. So you're, you're running from one job to another. You're part of the working poor. You're um, trying to, you know, to, to, to juggle uh, a job here, some childcare there, to make sure that, that you have a roof over your heads. It's not surprising, then, that the only place you get to eat a meal is on your lap. And then it's not surprising that the only food that, that, will, that you can eat in a hurry is food that is rich in salt and fat and sugar. So poverty is, uh, is, is correlated in rich countries with being overweight. And we can see some of those dynamics emerging about why. Well, I'll, I'll return to this paradox in a, in, a, in a little bit. But the interesting question here isn't why are, you know, why are these corporations trying to market stuff that we, you know, that, that's, that, that's profitable even though it's harming our health? Because th th that's an absurd question. Uh, the, 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 given the, the incentives and the rules that we have in place right now, they're doing exactly what we have chartered them to do, to maximize profit for shareholders. So the interesting question is not why do corporations behave this way? in the global food system. But why do we have a global food system at all? Why do we have these markets stretched from, you know, for, from one part of the world to another, where five big countries uh, and, a, few, and, and, and you know, a handful of corporations will export the, world's, you know, the majority of the world's wheat, for example? How does that happen? Well, to answer that question, we need a little bit of history. And so I, I want to take you back in time to where the world's first global grain market was created. The world's first global grain market is, was created in India. Uh, in, uh, and it's only about 140 years old, is this, this grain market. Uh, and it was created by the British. And they had to, to, to destroy the existing economy there to be able to put their new economy in, in its place. And, and the way it works is like this. Uh, so uh, those of you who don't know, India was a feudal economy. Uh, in, the, uh, in the 19th century. And what that means is that uh, you had landlords who had a lot of land, and then peasants who worked their land, right? But it's a crappy system. There's, if, if you are a peasant in a feudal economy, there's not much to look forward to, uh, because you will work and then you'll have your surplus taken away by the landlord. The only bright side to feudalism uh, is if there is a famine, if there is a, a drought, if the crops fail, if you don't have anything to eat, it's the landlord's responsibility to feed you. It's what's called a moral economy. Uh, and every, you know, in every sort of old, ancient sort of economy, there was some duty of the powerful to the poor. But the British came, and they saw you know, landlords giving away free food to hungry peasants. And the British said, landlords, you don't need to be feeding the peasants. We have a much better idea for you. What you're going to do, you're going to employ them. So you will pay them to work on your land, and that will, that will be the end of your obligations to them. And not only that, there's more. Uh, we will buy from you whatever grain you are prepared to sell us. And we'll give you way more money than you could imagine from you know, having within the Indian context. We British are rich beyond your imagination. And we will buy all your grain and we will use it to feed our, uh, the workers in our industrial cities. And you Indian landlords, you will, you will, be, you will be incredibly happy campers. 
Uh, and the Indian landlord said, uh, no thanks, we're fine. And the British said, no, no, we have guns. <laughs> and so it was. Uh, the, the, I mean, the, 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 that again is a sort of abbreviated history of uh, the uh, British colonization of India. Um, but, but it's important to bear in mind that, that, that these global markets, you know, the, the markets where things go from one place to another to another, they're not natural. There's nothing normal about these markets. They are the artifact of history and an artifact of, of colonialism in this case. But so, so, and it's important to remember that when the British were doing this, in a sense, they did not lie. Uh, because as a result of these, these markets, uh, India produced more food per person than it ever had before in its history. There were millions of tons of grain being exported from India at the end of the 19th century. So the, you know, in a sense, the British were telling the truth because they aligned the incentives and because the British were able to get, uh, you know, to be able to pay Indian uh, landlords a lot of money for their grain comparatively. That grain, you know, the, the, the grain, the incentive to grow grain was way over the top. And so there were millions of grains, uh, tons of grain exported. The downside is that as a result of th these introductions of markets in grain, um, Indians themselves were priced out of the market. And so you had Indians dying, you know, loading these bags of grain onto the trains that would end up in, end up in Calcutta or in Bombay and then, then thence to the rest of the empire. Well, those people would die of hunger even as they were loading more grain than had ever been produced before in India's history. And that points to a lesson about the way hunger works today. Um, because the reason we have hunger in the world today is not because there is a shortage of food. Um, it's, it's just worth restating that we have more calories per person than we've ever had before in human history. We are growing more food per person in the, uh, in the world today than we've ever had before. The reason people go hungry is not because we have a shortage of food but because the way we distribute food is through the market. And in the market, if you're rich, you get to eat, and if you, don't, if, if you are poor, you starve. So that's something, that's just sort of the outline of the, the global food system. And I, I, I want to suggest that that's been getting worse, that there have been forces uh, in India, for example, uh, that, that have in, encouraged a kind of return to this uh, feudal, oh no, sorry, to this just a post-feudal economy. Um, and India is, I mean, India is an interesting place to look. I, I, I feel like you know, as part of Global Fest, it's important to understand India. Because for many people, India is the place where, um, you know, you, you pick up, you, you call the gas company, and there is someone down the other end uh, in Bangalore pretending to be Bob. Uh, who's answering your call. And, uh, you know, when people in the United States think of India, India is the place of, you know, where everyone's got a PhD in computer science and is defragmenting hard drives on street corners, because that's how you do it, with, you defragment with a chisel. Um, and, but of course, India is predominantly a rural country, and so the stories that matter most in India are stories that, that, that are agricultural. And one in six of the planet's farmers are Indian. Uh, and so that points to, to some of the, the, the sort of tension in, in this sort of Indian narrative. And India is a country that underwent a, 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 a dramatic transformation in its economy. In, in, the, in the early 1990s, uh, India became a, a country that was open to international investment. And so from being a closed economy, uh, it became an economy that was open for business. And so it was you know, free markets everywhere. The government took a step back from uh, distributing food to the poor through what was called a, the public distribution system. Uh, it took a step back from buying on time from farmers, from its commitments to agriculture. Uh, and it let, you know, it, it let in as much capital and, and sort of corporate interest as, 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 as corporations were able to jam down the, the, the Indian parliament's throat. And for some people, that worked out very well. So in the late, two, you know, about four, sort of four or five years ago, if you read Forbes uh, and you saw their billionaires list, they were top, the, the top 10 richest men in the world, and they were all men, uh, four of them were from India. Four of the richest men in the world were from India. That's more than from any other country, more than from China, more than from Europe, more than from the United States. 
At the same time, India was undergoing an epidemic of uh, increase in the le level of farmer suicides uh, because Indian, you know, the Indian government wasn't paying its farmers on time, it wasn't lending to them, and so the power to lend and to, 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 to be the, the sort of local kingpin in the farming system usually went to the local moneylender who was a local seed dealer, who was the local um, uh, buyer of, uh, of whatever output th there was. Uh, and so it, it was a local grain trader and middleman. And concentrating all that power in the hands of one person was a recipe for disaster for indebted farmers. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you, you're seeing these sort of increasing levels of hunger. I mean, when I was growing up, uh, my mother told me, you know, eat up, there are children starving in Africa. People say that around the world, eat up, there are children starving in Africa. What do, what, what do parents in Africa tell their children? What do parents in Africa tell their kids? Well, they, they say, eat up, there are children, in South Africa, they say, eat up, there are children starving in India. And they are right. There are more children starving in India than there are in all of Africa. In fact, there are more hungry people in India than there are in all of Africa. Uh, and that's, again, that runs counter to this sort of image of India as the, you know, the techno place. But India is a, is a place of ex extremes. I mean, India has um, the world's largest private residence. Uh, it's called Antilla. It's a, like a, it's a huge office block style thing. Um, it's $1.5 billion is what it costs to, to build. It has a staff of 600 people. Uh, helipad on top, you know, multi-level garage, for a family of four. Uh, and that's, that happens where, at the feet of Antilla, there are people dying of hunger. And in fact, in, in, in Bombay, where Antilla is, um, it's, a, it's a city where th th there's another horrible epidemic in India of type 2 diabetes. India is now the country with the largest number of people with type 2 diabetes. Uh, and that's... You know, I mean, I think it's important to, 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 have a, you know, to, to reflect on that. I mean, how is it that India has epidemic levels of diabetes? Well, in part, it has to do with the introduction of sugary beverages uh, into India. Uh, and before, well, not just the introduction, but the heavy marketing of these sugary beverages. Um, at the end of the 1980s, India didn't have Coke or Pepsi. It had, uh, 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 because India, the Indian government had kicked out Coke or Pepsi for not sharing the technology of how to make Coke and Pepsi with the Indian government. Uh, so instead, India had this homegrown version called Thumbs Up. Uh, and Thumbs Up is, well, it's Coke-ish. Uh, it's an acquired taste, but it's fine. But at the end of the, at the beginning of the 1990s, all of a sudden, Coke and Pepsi were allowed in. And once Coke and Pepsi were allowed in, uh, the, the games changed. Uh, so now all of a sudden there were these adverts on TV screens, like the global Coke advert, um, which is, um, you know, it, 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 it's the polar bear advert, right? Back in the 1990s, it's the same as it is now. The polar bears, you, you've seen the polar bears, right? The, um, you know, the, the polar bears waddle along and they go, mmm, Coke. And... Uh, yeah. So, so, you know, I, I, those of you who are not familiar with Indian cultural iconography, uh, polar bears are not big in India. You know, it, it, <laughs> I, I, you know and the, the, the northern lights are not something, you know, so, so you, you, you have a billion people seeing this on television going, what the fuck's that? Um, whereas Pepsi, Pepsi get it right. With Pepsi, it's the Bollywood A-list. Uh, and since it's Global Fest, I will be... So it, it was, it was like... Da, 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 da. It, it's like the... the well, actually, that, that's more sort of vaudeville. But, you know, you get the idea of like... Da, 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 da. Uh, and it's, it's, it's like um, Slumdog Millionaire, uh, but with Pepsi. And the, the result is... I mean, the, it, it works. As a marketing strategy, it works very well. And uh, the... But, but, of course, in this battle, it's aliens versus predator, right? It's a sort of titanic battle between these two massive corporations, and the result is that in some Indian cities, diabetes rates are at 20%. Uh, and that's, you know, and even in the slums, uh, the diabetes rates are around 13 or 14%. Uh, so this is, you know, this is a, a sort of massive public health crisis in some of the poorest places on earth. Uh, and uh, although diabetes rates are around 3% in rural areas, they're, they're now on their way up too. So, yeah, and, and th these have been sort of exacerbated by an organization for which I once worked. And I, I, I ought to explain for those of you who don't understand. So, uh, are people familiar with the World Bank? I know there are a couple of people who are saying the World Bank was like the World Food Bank, and that's not the same thing. Um, so, so, the World Bank is, um, 
it, it's, it's a multilateral lending institution that, that lends with conditionalities, and so, sometimes that's a little hard to understand. So uh, th th there is an analogy that I would like to share with you. Um, are, are people here familiar with Terry Gilliam's film, Time Bandits? Do, are, are people heard of Time Bandits? Uh, do, for those of you who haven't, it, it, Time Bandits is about disgruntled former employees of God. Uh, so you know the story. The, the universe was built in six days. So it was a rush job. And uh, God uh, had help, but he didn't treat his workers very well. So you know, you've got a universe full of holes and people who are disgruntled with God. Uh, and so th th these former employees steal a map of the universe, and they use it to jump through the holes in the universe and use it to, to rob people. And so in one scene, they rob Napoleon, and they steal Napoleon stuff. And they, they, you know, they, they jump through this hole, and they end up in Sherwood Forest, uh, where they are met by Robin Hood. Uh, who's played by John Cleese, uh, who's a, a, a sort of upper-class twit. You know, he's, he's, a sort of, he's wearing a big green pointy hat, and he calls himself Hood. Um, and Hood is very excited to see all Napoleon stuff. Uh, and uh, Hood's like, well, this is tremendous. What, what can I say? Thank you very much indeed. I mean, the, the poor will love this. Have you met the poor? The charming people. Uh, of course, they don't have two pennies to rub together, but that's because they're poor. Um, and so there's a line of poor people who are brought on. Bring on the poor. So the poor are like lined up here. And Hood is working the line. And it's like, well, there we are. Look, uh, you know, diamonds for you. Yes, jolly good. Well done. Congratulations. And uh, you know, a gilded mirror for you. Yes, how long have you been poor? Jolly good. Well done. Um, and next to Hood is this big bloke who takes whatever Hood has given and punches the poor person in the face. So that's how the World Bank works. That's the... <laughs> Hold that image in your mind for a second, right? We've got, first of all, we have the have you met the poor and the charming people. So I, the project I worked on at the World Bank was about, um, it was called Voices of the Poor, Can Anyone Hear Us? And it was the World Bank's way of saying, have you met the poor? We had lunch with the poor yesterday. They think we're terrific. Uh, so, so there's this sort of massive self-deception that's going on at the World Bank. And then you know, there is the, the process of lending. So the, you know, the World Bank's like, yeah, go, go buy yourself something nice. Off you go. Um, but it is a bank. So the, the money is always given back. Uh, it's, it's always returned. Uh, and of course, it's always forgotten that the, the loans are usually given to cover the last World Bank loan. But in that moment of, no, oh, go buy yourself something nice, all of this is forgotten. But the loan is always repaid. It's always taken back. And then comes the punch in the face. And the punch in the face is about this, you know, this economic structural adjustment, the, the, this uh, process of the World Bank saying, you, you, know, you, Haiti, for example, must not subsidize your own farmers. Yes, we understand that uh, you are able to grow the majority of your own rice, but what's better for you, rather than subsidizing your farmers, is to have free trade. Free trade is going to be fantastic for you. Uh, your farmers will have the improving winds of competition, and they will become more efficient, and you will, everyone will prosper. Uh, but in agriculture, there's no such thing as free trade. We in the United States subsidize our rice farmers to the, to the tune of a billion dollars a year. Uh, the European Union has a multi-billion dollar subsidy system as well. And they're not dismantling that. So when the World Bank says, you Haitian farmers must compete with no subsidy against a billion dollar a year subsidy over here in the United States, well, what do you think happens? Of course, farmers exploit themselves, exploit the land, and then move to the cities where uh, the, the sweatshops have been set up for them to manufacture cheap textiles for us over here. And in fact, ju just before the, the earthquake, earthquake struck, there was a, a, a position paper from uh, Oxford economist Paul Collier, who said that the reason Haiti wasn't prospering was not because it had given up its agricultural subsidies, but because the sweatshops were only working eight hours a day. And if they w moved to a 24-hour-a-day uh, sweatshop cycle, and this is the World Bank, you know, this is, this is a, a, a policy recommendation from one of the world's top development economists. Uh, he's saying if, if you switch to a 24-hour-a-day development cycle, um, Haiti will be able to lift itself out of poverty. Um, now, I mean, th that's fairly abject and shameless. And even and, and a man who's not known for his shame, uh, President Bill Clinton, uh, even he uh, recently apologized for, for his hand in imposing these structural adjustment policies when he said, look, we shouldn't treat food like a commodity. It's not a commodity like television sets, is, is essentially what he said uh, when in, in recent Senate testimony. He said, look, how can we expect countries to develop if they're not able to feed themselves? And I think, you know, I, I agree with Bill Clinton when he's not agreeing with all the things he did with NAFTA and the World Trade Organization or what have you. I, I agree with apologetic Bill Clinton. 
Uh, I think that he's right. Th that, that there is something different about agriculture that we shouldn't treat it as a commodity. So that's great. Oh, I, 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 all right, we're, all, we're all agreed. You, me, and apologetic Bill Clinton are agreed that we shouldn't treat food like television sets. So what do we do about that? Well, um, you know, here we are living our everyday lives. And, and you might think, well, okay, let's go to a supermarket and we'll buy something that says, you know, fair trade, shade grown, organic, uh, you know, certified dolphin friendly, tuna compatible. Uh, and, you know, there'll be a long list of labels on this thing that, that uh, you know, make us feel much better about how we're, you know, we're approaching these things. Um, but the, 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 the problem is that. You, I mean, the, the, to, to, to just merely change the way that we shop is to participate in this sort of fiction that you, if, if all of us just buy the right things, we can together change the world by shopping. Uh, and there's, I mean, no, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I mean, I buy fair trade coffee because because what's the alternative? Bastard coffee? You know, the, the, uh, uh, coffee that involves you know, exploitation of children? No, of course not. I mean, you, 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 buy fair, you buy the right thing because it's the right thing to do. But herein is the paradox, right? How is it that 1% of the world's coffee can be, you know, uh, you can opt in not to exploit people, but 99% of the coffee is about exploitation, and we're okay with that? Uh, I mean, th there's something that's, I mean, it, obviously it's important to shop smart, um, but shopping. You know, I mean, it, no social change has ever been achieved through the shopping basket. And so the interesting question is, why do, you know, what is it that we have to come, we have to confront to be able to make durable change? And the answer is hard to, I mean, it's, it's, it, 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 it's, a, big, it's a big picture answer. Because when you're shopping, uh, I mean, the reason we go to supermarkets is because they're convenient. And convenience is a social construct. We live it every day, but it's very hard to challenge convenience. I mean, uh, uh, you know, if, if there's one idea that I, I want you to walk away from this, this talk uh, with, it's the idea that we have to do a lot more uh, work on ourselves and the things that make us if we are to transform the food system. I, I mean, here's an example. Look, I was... Uh, I mean, I've got no moral high ground. As I was saying earlier on, I, 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 to, 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 to a smaller group, I mean, I, I, my PhD was fueled by Red Bull. Right, uh, I, Red Bull. Uh, it, it's, it's geared towards college students. A few college students here. You may have seen the marketing directed at you. Red Bull. You know, it's uh, Red Bull gives you wings. It, uh, it, it, there's there's a particular advert where uh, a college student is faced with either completing a term paper or um, making out with his girlfriend. But if he drinks Red Bull, then he can do both. Um, <laughs> Now, uh, uh, Red Bull is what? Well, Red Bull, the basic ingredients of Red Bulls are, Red Bull is water, caffeine, sugar, and you know, a bunch of amino acids, taurine, creatine, that you can most easily find in your own urine. Um, now, if you were to explain to someone, look, here's a fantastic, imagine explaining to your great-grandparent uh, that, that uh, you, you know, you're drinking this fantastic beverage, it gives you wings, a few more hours in the day, how, you know, how fantastic is that? Uh, and the, the, you know, your great-grandparent goes, well, yeah, that's terrific, what's inside? And you will say, well, it's water and it's sugar, I, I know what that is, and, create, you know, and, and caffeine, oh yeah, same thing as in tea, yeah. and piss. If you were to explain that to your grandparent, uh, you know, questions would be asked, I think. Uh, it, <laughs> And yet we find ourselves, cons I mean, it, it fits into our daily life because of the way that we have structured our lives, where we have vanishingly little time to eat, vanishingly little time to work, uh, I mean, to, to, to do things that are not about work and not about staying awake, uh, where, we, where we're running from one thing to another to another, again, just to, just to squeeze in an hour more of productivity from every day, we will eat and drink the most barbaric stuff. I mean, there was, I mean, I recently saw a bar of Snickers called Snickers Charged, which was all the usual sort of crazy things that are in a Snickers bar, plus caffeine. Um, and and, and these, these are the kinds of food that we find, you know, the most absurd food products, food-like products, but they become part of our natural lives because of the rhythm of the way that we work and the, the, the rhythm of the way that we live. And so if we're going to take on this myth, we have to understand that you know, when you go to a supermarket, uh, you believe that, that you know, the aisles that you face are aisles full of free choice, that the food is made for you. But actually, in every way that matters, we are made for our food. We are being transformed into the kinds of creatures that find the most absurd food products to be normal. And that transformation is a real operation of power. 
That's what that's what is like to, to, to be to, to experience power. It's to, to, to not be able to, to be able to find the most incredibly strange things normal. Someone who can do that is in a position of deep, deep power and deep, deep power over us, where we think that it is normal to go into a supermarket. Uh, it is normal to find our daily needs uh, in a brightly lit warehouse, which is nothing more than a machine for making us consume. I mean, because that's what supermarkets are, right? Supermarkets are engines for making us consume stuff that we don't need. Uh, supermarkets are designed to make us uh, impulse purchase. They are, you know, the milk is always at the back because, you know, that's the one thing that we're most often in supermarkets to buy. Uh, and so, you know, and, and the, the music in supermarkets is geared towards making us, cons you know, to make it uh, buy comfort food. And the smell of baking bread is make it des you know, designed to make us co uh, consume more. They found that that's why, that's why bakeries are in supermarkets these days is because they found the smell of baking bread makes us buy more stuff. Um, and so, if that's, the, if that's the case, what do we do about that? Well, I mean, I, I think th th there is a group that I, I uh, find uh, addresses some of these more structural problems. Um, and it's a group called Slow Food. Uh, I don't know if people here are familiar with slow food, but I, I mean, slow food has a bad reputation in the United States as a kind of circle jerk of olive oil fanciers and red wine fetishists. Um, but actually, slow food is an incredibly interesting organization. It's, uh, it's an organization that started in Italy as a response to you know, th th this sort of culture of fast food, of accelerated food, of not thinking about food, of having corporations control what we think. And so slow food understood that in, you know, in order to, for everyone to eat properly, we need two things. You need time and you need money. So what does slow food do? Well, first of all, they, uh, they take on the money element and they go for Italy's poorest workers. Now, the poorest workers are agricultural workers. So they go and they unionize Italy's agricultural workers. So they raise the wages of the, world, of, of the poorest workers in the country. And then they fight for more time. So they, they fight for a two-hour lunch break so that workers can actually enjoy the fruits of their labor. So now you, you're, you're taking on this issue of, uh, of fighting the, the, the injustices of the food system by recognizing, first of all, in order to end, for everyone to be able to eat, you need money. So we have to tackle poverty very directly. Uh, but also in order for us to be able to actually reclaim our ability to think for ourselves and to cook for ourselves, to eat for ourselves, uh, we need to take back time from the way it has been stolen from us. You know, the, the way to fight Red Bull is by taking a long, longer lunch break. I mean, I think that that's actually pretty revolutionary, the, the idea that you seize time back from the man, uh, and, you, uh, and, and in so doing, you seize your tastes, and you seize joy. And I, I love that about slow food. Uh, and ultimately, what slow food recognizes is that what you need when you're taking on the food system is a kind of radical democracy of pleasure. Because what, what slow food is saying is, look, uh, it, it, everyone has the capacity to enjoy food. But in order to take on, you know, for everyone to, to actually have that capacity actualized, you need, you need time and money. You, you actually need to organize. You need, uh, you need to, we, need, we need to democratize pleasure. And that's an idea that, I've, uh, that, that feeds into one of the biggest ideas that I've, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited by. It's, a, it's, a, it's an idea of food sovereignty. Uh, food sovereignty has a long definition, and you can find it on Wikipedia. Um, but the essence of food sovereignty is we need a democratic conversation about our food system. Uh, and we need, uh, we need to confront uh, climate change together. We need to dis confront distribution together. We need to confront uh, the, 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 you know, the, the changing tastes that, we're, that are imposed on us together. And I want to give you an example. Uh, I want to give you a story that we're working on at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm working on a documentary. Uh, right now called Generation Food. Uh, and Generation Food, I, I'm working with a, a, a director, Steve James. Uh, now, Steve, unfortunately, documentary filmmakers don't get the recognition they deserve. But Steve is uh, the, the director of, um, of Hoop Dreams, uh, one of the finest documentaries uh, of, you know, of, of, US, of, of US modern times. And also, more recently, The Interrupters. So Steve and I are traveling the world showing how different struggles in India, in um, uh, the United States, in Peru, and in Malawi are fighting back against a, a very unsustainable food system. And I want to tell you the Malawi story, because I think this is an incredibly hopeful story. It's a story that's, um, that, that actually points a way to a, a more sustainable food system, and it has direct record lessons for us here. Uh, you know, the, the lessons of a small village in northern Malawi 
are ones that I think that we have a lot to learn from. So here's, here's the story. Malawi is, as everyone knows, uh, a small landlocked country in uh, sub-Saharan Africa whose primary export is tobacco. Everyone knew that, but you know, just in case. Um, uh, so, so Malawi is not doing well. Um, but yeah, the tobacco is not a great thing to be exporting. It's not, a, you know, uh, in terms of its global price, it's not doing too well. Um, but Malawi decided that it was going to, you know, sort of give the finger to the World Bank by doing something that, that very few developing countries have the, the chops to do, and that's to support its farmers, which I think is a terrific idea. Unfortunately, what Malawi decides to do is to give its, fertil its farmers fertilizer. Um, and this, this isn't such a good idea because Malawi, as I say, dirt poor, uh, dependent on the tobacco harvest of, uh, its, its dollar, you know, for its pile of dollars that it then spends on things. And Malawi doesn't have fossil fuels, and fertilizer is basically fossil fuel. Inorganic fertilizer is basically natural gas. And uh, so that's, so Malawi has to buy this fertilizer, and unfortunately, they buy it in 2008. Now, in 2008, you'll remember the world food price crisis happened. Uh, the prices of all kinds of food went through the roof. But the thing, the, the, the commodity with the highest price rise was fertilizer. Price of fertilizer went up by 250%. So that's when Malawi decides to buy fertilizer. Uh, and Malawi then, uh, and, and it runs out of money for things like gasoline. So th there are riots in the streets because people can't, you know, are unable to access gasoline. But you may think, well, look, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry the Malawians can't drive as much as they want, but, but maybe this, is, this has worked out okay. Maybe the people have been able to eat. Um, to some extent, splashback. Uh, to some extent, they did. Uh, between 2008 and 2009, um, harvests doubled. And uh, that was very splashy water. Um, so harvest doubled. And, uh, and, and that sounds terrific. And in fact, the, the, um, Jeff Sachs, uh, the, the, the Columbia economist, was very excited because he's like, look at, the, look at the stuff over here and then look at the stuff over there. Um, he does a lot of leaping, does Jeff Sachs. And, he, and he, was, he was very excited by this. But unfortunately, the main reason that, food, uh, that harvests doubled uh, between 2008 and 2009 is because the rains came on time. And in Malawi, they haven't been doing that so much recently. Uh, the, the, I mean, the fertilizer helped by about 15%, but the majority of the increase was due to rains coming on time. Um, and now, of course, Malawi was stuffed because it, it spent all its money on, uh, on, on, uh, on this fertilizer, and now there's nothing left. Uh, so that's what happened in southern Malawi, and, and right now southern Malawi is in what's called the hunger season. Um, it's, it's that time of the year where the crops are in the ground, uh, the money that you had from last year from selling your crops is just about to run out, and you can't harvest yet. That's the hunger season. Malawi, in, in, in the south of Malawi, that's what's happening right now, and it's a disaster. But in northern Malawi, there is, well, there's, there's this village, um, it's called Bwabwa. And it started, uh, there's, there's a, uh, there was a hospital there that was doing infant malnutrition uh, training. And, and they, were, you know, they noticed lots of kids coming in with, uh, you know, w w with malnutrition. And you know, Malawi has a life expectancy of 52. They're about uh, between 12% uh, you know, uh, uh, of the population living with AIDS. Uh, and so there are a lot of kids coming in whose mothers have HIV, and this hospital is like, look, we can fix this. But what we need to do first is get farmers to stop growing tobacco and get them to, you know, and stop growing corn, which is the main sort of food crop there. And we need to diversify the farm system. So they, they work with 5,000 farmers to come up with new kinds of nutritious crop. Uh, and, they, and they also discover, look, you, these farmers are so poor, they can't afford fertilizer. They can't, you know, the, 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 there's no way that they can access this kind of farming system. So instead, let's figure out different ways of farming. So all of a sudden, this nutrition program becomes a farming program. And the farming program discovers some amazing stuff. Like you can grow, uh, ama you can get really rich yields if you, if you plant cowpea and millet. Uh, and sorghum and soybeans and uh, leguminous, like, uh, le leguminous trees, trees that fix nitrogen in the soil and then sort of stretch over the, 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 the fields. And you may think, well, when I was growing up, again, you think of how plants grow and you need sun and you need water and you need soil. So why would you have shade as part of your, your, your farming mix? Um, well, it's climate change. Uh, farmers in Malawi know that climate change is happening. 
And for them, in, in the fields, uh, the temperature is, is, go, is, is going sky high. Um, you know, we all know photosynthesis needs sunlight, but we may not know that photosynthesis stops at 100. So here's a problem for you. How is it possible that you can have 15% more food in the fields than with conventional agriculture, and infant malnutrition goes up? How can you have more food in the fields and infant malnutrition goes up? Take a guess. Carbohydrates. Uh, no, in, in this case, actually, there's, there's a nice mix of carbohydrates and, uh, uh, and nutritious kind of proteins and uh, leafy greens. So wh while a monoculture of like corn, for example, would be a reason why infant malnutrition goes up, in this case, actually, it's better. So another guess. Sorry? Free trade, yes, uh, often, you know, in, in cases where uh, you have, uh, uh, you know, people who are growing food for export, um, that food will, will be taken away and then you're left with money, but then that, that money may not be able to be used to be able to get a nutritious crop. So why else? Remember, the, the question is this, more stuff out, coming out of the soil, increased malnutrition for kids, why? More kids, no, in this case, I mean, it, it's, it, this is, the, the number of kids hasn't changed. Export. No, again, this is, this is for domestic consumption. Go on. Don't know how to cook it. That's partly the problem, but not in, that's not the primary reason. One more. Go on. No fuel. No, actually, this, the system is better because, um, this, because you have these trees, that, uh, these leguminous trees. Uh, women don't have to traipse off into the, into the back of beyond to, to pick up the fuel. Uh, they can get the, you know, the, a branch off the tree. But... Uh, it's important that women are doing that. And, and, and the answer is this, that uh, the reason you can have more food in the fields and increase malnutrition is because harvesting is women's work. Harvesting is women's work. Uh, and that's a problem because breastfeeding is women's work and fetching firewood is women's work and cooking is women's work and fetching water is women's work. So when there's more stuff to harvest and there's still the same amount of water to be fetched, the firewood to be got and the cooking to be done, what's the thing that goes? It's breastfeeding. So how do you fix that? Formula? No, 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 no. We're not, we're not going there. No, no, no. <laughs> we're not going to go formula. No, no, no. How, I mean, if you were serious about fixing this problem, how would you fix it? Make, make, make the men cook. Fantastic. How do you do that? How do you make men cook? Hit them over the head. We don't know. That's okay. so. Well, that, no. That, but that's the answer that the farmers had. Um, so the, 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 these farmers, women and men farmers, are, are like, look, it's, it's clear that this is a gender problem, and what we need to do is get men to cook. How do we do that? Well, you know, what we'll do, we'll get a, we'll get like a, we'll go around to their house, and we will teach them, uh, and we will have a nutritionist and a cook, and you know, just some buddies. And we'll go around to their house, and we'll, we'll, we'll make it work. You know, it's kind of a food network thing. We'll just beam it into their house. Uh, so it's a food network without electricity. And so we have, you know, so the, you know, the expert comes around and it's like, hello man, he goes, hello, how are you? So here, here's, a, here's a pot, you may have seen one of these before, we're gonna put it here, we're gonna put some stuff in, we're gonna light the fire underneath, and we're gonna stir it around for a bit and it's gonna be terrific. And the man's like, oh, that's, thanks, thanks very much, I've always wanted, wondered how that worked. Uh, that, that's great, thank you, thanks very much, bye, bye bye. Um, and then of course nothing changed. Uh, the men were like, yeah, well, sod that. I mean, I, 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 that, that looked like way too much work. So, so then what do they do? Well, then the farmers are like, look, there's clearly, there's, what works about the farming system is that it's peer-to-peer -peer and it's about everyone experimenting and it's about people doing things together. The problem with that model is that it's not peer-to-peer. -peer. It's about a lecture and it's about, you know, uh, in, you know, it's about embarrassment and about shame. And instead, we should, we should flip this about. So what they did was have, create something called a recipe day. And recipe days are um, these, these new kind of weird, I mean, they're, they're sort of a day where everyone kind of experiments with radical equality. They're a day where uh, people get together and, um, first of all, you know, they're going to experiment with things like sorghum and cowpea and millet. Uh, and you know, th these things are like people, people are like, yes, we, we, we hear amazing things that these are really nutritious. Um, but I mean, they're, they're confronting a problem that you're very familiar with, I imagine, uh, which is you know, basically it's like kale. No one knows what the hell to do with it. 
Uh, and and so, so people, well, I've got, I mean, obviously here you, you know what to do with it, but, but most people don't know what the hell to do with kale. Uh, and so uh, you, you're, you're trying to figure out, look, millet and cowpea, cowpea. No one knows, it, and it turns out actually deep frying things is, is a big hit. Uh, because if you deep fry things, it, it makes them taste better. But actually there are some really fantastic kind of millet porridges um, that, that, that people are developing. People are learning how to make soy milk. Uh, and these are new skills, right? Soy is not indigenous to uh, Malawi, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, but it is an incredibly nutritious crop, and people love it. Uh, the thing is that soy is traditionally considered, you know, you're making soy milk and you're pounding, you're pounding the soy, and, and, and that's considered a, 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 a gendered thing to do. It's women's work. But at these recipe days, men come and try it out. And it's, it's interesting because you know, initially when we saw, we saw men just look very gingerly, kind of like, oh, oh look at that, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm pounding soybeans like a little girl. Uh, and and, and it, was, it was very transgressive. I mean, you know, it, they, they mocked it, they were embarrassed, there was lots of irony and distancing, and then they kind of got into it, but in large part because there were men and women there who were um, not judging them, but actually sort of encouraging them along and, and, and trying to create this sort of space of equality. And, and, and men were being called out by women on their sexism. And while in, in the home that, that would have resulted in a quarrel, here it became a sort of safe space where women and men could not only solve the kale problem, but solve the man problem. You know, not only were they coming up with, competing with each other to have these amazing recipes, uh, but also uh, coming up with new ways of experiencing equality. And that, I think, is really useful, uh, because it wasn't a carnival, right? This, this recipe day, were 100 people there, and you know, the, the men and women were not sort of subverting power. The men were not mocking the women, or the women were not mocking the men. This was about a prefigurative community, a community where uh, people were trying out for the first time what equality would be like, where women were empowered and men were equal. And it worked. Uh, and what we're seeing uh, is that we have, we have some data, uh, anecdotal at the moment, about men's participation in this, resulting in men doing the cooking at home, but also doing things as crazy as getting the water and, uh, and fetching firewood. But you also see, uh, you know, you know space, this is a space where other kinds of relations get, you know, inequalities get uh, uh, challenged. So uh, mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law, which is a, a fraught relationship no matter where you are, uh, th those kinds of interactions uh, in, in Malawi that there's, there's for, for bad colonial reasons, mothers-in-law tell daughters-in-law to wean their daughters, uh, wean their kids at two months and feed them oats and water. Uh, and that advice is now being sort of pushed back on by uh, daughters-in-law who are, you know, and, and it, that kind of conversation, always difficult to have. But in, in this sort of space, it became a little bit more thinkable and a little more doable. And what was interesting about this space is that this is a time of equality. And it, it means that not only at the end of the day do men participate in household work, but you also have increased child uh, nutrition, and in the longer term, um, people are now making money from this sustainable kind of climate change ready farming. Now you may think, all right, look, here's a, a village in, uh, yeah, here's a village in northern Malawi. That has absolutely nothing to, talk, to, to say to us here. And you would be wrong. I mean, globally, of course, uh, the number of, if you were thinking about the nearly billion people who are going hungry in the world today, 60% are women or girls. Uh, and in the United States, what's the group that's most likely to be food insecure in the United States? It's female-headed households. 35% of female-headed households in this country are uh, food insecure. If you look at the poorest paid people in the U.S. society, they're in the, they're, they're in the, the, food, uh, the, the, the food system where um, nationally the, the wage is $2.13 an hour uh, for food service work uh, if there's tips involved. And m the majority of people in, the, in those kinds of work are women. Uh, so, I mean, and of course, we, we know that, that, you know, that, that systematic inequality of women being paid 70% for the same work as men. Uh, that, you know, sexism is alive and well in our society, and that's, you know, that, that's everyone's, I mean, it's certainly, a, it's, a, it's a project that I'm trying to thresh out of myself, that it'll be a lifetime's project, but it's something that has to be done. And what this space shows is that it's possible to do it. Uh, and it, it also shows us how science can work, because what what's also important about the, the, this, you know, this recipe day is that it's a new way of doing science that's peer-to-peer, -peer, where everyone gets to be a, an expert, and everyone's expertise counts and it matters. And that's a radically different way of farming than you know, the Monsanto-driven, uh, you know, expert-driven systems. Uh, and what this also is, is about is a new way of thinking about distribution. Because in this system, uh, everyone, you know, I mean, the, the commitment here is that everyone gets fed. It's not, about, it's not on a basis of an ability to pay, it's about need. And distribution happens within the space on the basis of need, and it carries on outside that system. So what I love about that is that it's 
transgressive in almost every way. It, it, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 it tackles big systemic problems of sexism, of distribution, um, and of climate change. And it does it all within a, you know, a, the small story of a village. So that's the kind of story that, that I feel really empowered by. But I, I think that there are these big stories happening in the United States. There are groups doing amazing things around suspending private property rights in uh, Detroit, where there's some of the most amazing urban farms happening right now. We're, we're covering some of those stories. We're seeing in, in, um, uh, in Oakland, there's a group called People's Grocery. Have you heard of the People's Grocery? Some of you have heard of it. So the, the idea of the People's Grocery was to, to, to work in communities where there's epidemic levels of uh, hunger and, uh, in the United States, uh, where, where almost half the people are in, at some point during the year food insecure. Uh, and where there are no uh, supermarkets serving West Oakland. And the, the, the People's Grocery has now morphed into something called the People's Community Market, and it's all about taking money from the community and applying it to the market so that people own their own co-op uh, and own their own food system. Uh, th these kinds of examples are not you know, in Malawi, but they speak to one another. It's about community empowerment and about com people controlling the forces of money and of food within their economy. And I think that's, I mean, th that's a good place to stop because I, I, I and, and, and to, to start having a conversation, to start exchanging what we know, because I think the United States is an exciting place to be doing this kind of food system work. Um, I was explaining a little earlier on to some of you that, that uh, I mean, my, my hypothesis about the food movement in the US is that it, it's exploded as a result of you know, overt protest being criminalized. And, you know, after 9-11, taking to the streets and protesting about in injustice was, not a, you know, was usually met with police force. Um, but instead, we have a generation of people who have started, particularly young people, who are making change uh, through the food system and tackling some of the big problems through the food system. And, and that's why I became American, is because I, you know, in 2010, I became American because I, I, you know, I wanted to, to be part of a, 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 a U.S. food movement that would take on some of these issues. And of course, um, you know, the food movement in the United States, the mov movements in the United States, when they've taken on power, how have they done it? They've done it by putting our bodies on the line. Uh, whether it's the civil rights movement or you know, the, the women's right to vote, which was started off as a food riot or a series of food riots in 1917 and ended up with the 19th Amendment. But in all of these cases, it was, it was also about you know, running the risk of getting arrested. Uh, and, and of course, that's the other reason I became American is so that I wouldn't get deported uh, after... Uh, after, after taking on the man. Uh, but, but, uh, but, but, I, but I think that, that that's, uh, th there is a lot of energy and also now an increasing willingness to take on um, the, 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 the sort of power, centers of power in the food system. Uh, and so that's a task that I'm very much looking forward to doing uh, and to joining with you in, in taking on my fellow Americans. So thanks very much indeed. So now's, now's the fun part, where, where can, can we can, can maybe just, do, just have some questions, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll alternate genders if that's okay, if we're going to try and keep that going, but, but um, who's first? Go on, be brave. Yes, thank you. Um, so, so the question was, in developing countries, there are a lot of markets where uh, surplus food goes bad, and uh, while, while there are people going hungry around there, well, are there projects, projects aimed at, at fixing that problem? Yes, I mean, it, it, India, for example, has this sort of public distribution system that's meant to, uh, to transfer food from rural to urban areas and to make sure that, 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 there is, you know, that, that, that food is distributed evenly. But that, that kind of food waste isn't as acute in developing countries as, uh, as you might think. Uh, I mean, you, you're right that it happens, but if you look structurally at the way food waste happens, um, the majority of food waste in developing countries actually happens in storage. So when food waste is being, when food is being stored for the year, the big problem in developing countries is mold or rats or, you know, and, and by far the, the, the sort of greatest level of waste happens um, while food is being sort of stored for, you know, for, for across a year or two years or whatever it is. Um, so while that, you know, the, the food waste that happens at the end of the day at the market, um, and often that there are social economies around that, um, where people will, you know, I mean, in, in that sense, you know, gleaning and the, the arts of commoning food resources have not been utterly extinguished in developing countries in the way that they have here. 
uh, where you know dumpsters here are sometimes locked to prevent dumpster diving. Uh, but that problem isn't as acute uh, for, for developing countries as, as it is to some extent here. But here, our big food waste problem comes from uh, the economies, the, the way in which we have habituated ourselves to choice. Uh, and that's a much bigger problem. So, you know, if you go into, your, you know, go into uh, a chain restaurant and you find, you know, there's a prawn dish, a, a pork dish, a beef dish, a, a, you know, a lamb dish, or whatever it is. And you know, th that means that in the back, they've got all of these things. Plus, they've got, you know, they've got a range of things that you have come to expect as normal on a, uh, on a, restaurant, uh, you know, on a restaurant menu, no matter what the season. So you, know, you will expect to find tomatoes this time of year, even if they have to be trucked from Florida and then gassed you know, with ethylene and, and, uh, and, and, and put on the menu here. But, and because we have been used to, been, we, we expect this kind of choice to be available to us, uh, there's a huge economy that's set up to waste food just so we have you know, that illusion of choice. And that for me, it, for developing countries, is, it, for rich countries rather, for developed countries, that's a, that's a bigger source of, uh, of the food waste problem. So for de developed countries, the big problem is storage. Uh, but for us, our problems are, stem from the kind of consumer culture that we're embedded in, and that's, that's a much deeper problem. So while I take the, the point that yes, you know, the, the market waste is important, I, and I don't know of specific organizations, though usually it's religious organizations that, that will help transmit some of that. Um, the biggest problems lie at the other ends of the food spectrum of the, the retail and in rich countries and in the storage in, in developing countries. Sir? Um, in Malawi, what was the incentive for the men to become part of this uh, program? And do you think that would be translatable to all the different Thanks so much. That's a great question. I mean, so the incentive for, for, for men to be in this program was that it was fun. Uh, and because what, what the recipe day was was a celebration. And I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. I'm really glad that you asked. Because what, what's, what was, what was, what's great about a recipe day is that you can hear it a mile away. Um, there, you know, there are people singing, there's people dancing, there's kids playing, there's, there's clearly people having a good time. And so for men to come, I mean, it's it, it just by making it a site of joy and pleasure, uh, you get to incite social change in a way that if you just go, if, if you go to someone's house and say, you will cook like this, it'll, you know, and th there's not much fun about that. Uh, and that's why social change doesn't stick. We're, we're certainly, we're hypothesizing that in, in some of our social scientific work is that the reason change doesn't stick is because if you're, get, if you're getting lectured at, uh, there's, there's, nothing, there's something fairly universal that people being lectured at don't particularly have much fun. I've got present company accepted. Um, but uh, but when, you ha when you have these sort of arenas that are joyful, uh, th that's a kind of venue for social change to happen. Um, now, in fact, men have a hard time afterwards sometimes where uh, we, uh, we interviewed a, a few guys who say, look, I, you know, I, I went, I had a great time, and I started cooking, and then, you know, the, you know my, my guys just came around and took the pot away from me because they said that my wife had, you know, had, had, uh, cast a spell on me, that I was there under her petticoat uh, parliament. Uh, that, that, uh, you know, that, that, that I had witchcraft uh, you know, sort of place on me. And so th th there were these, th these moments of sort of tension b b where men, you know, men who had not been at these recipe days sort of staged an intervention to save their, their buddy from, you know, from, fr from being feminized. Um, but th what, what the, the longer term benefits are the, of increased uh, household income, and that's the other thing that, that, that looks good here. Uh, and, and it's also about increased ch child nutrition. So having more cash, having kids who are better off, uh, and having relationships that are functional is, is, is a draw in many cases. Uh, and, but the main draw is the joy. And, and that's something we're, we're noticing. Even in Detroit, there's a group called Cook, Eat, Talk. You know, have a guess what they do. Um, so, so yeah, they, 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 organize, they organize neighborhood by neighborhood, like block by block, and they cook together, and they eat, and then they talk about the political problems that they're facing. And uh, you know, one of the taboos in the United States is that you never talk about politics over the dinner table. So that's what they do. They talk about politics over the dinner table. Uh, and by making it, you know, the, breaking this rule, uh, by, by stepping into this taboo, but making it a fun thing to do, often it works. Not always, but a, 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 a great deal of the time, they're able to engage in these kinds of discussions around, uh, around gender, around work, and around what politicians need to be doing uh, in ways that are very constructive. So I, I think the joy is, for me, the common denominator here, the, the, the pleasure of getting people together around food. And we notice that wherever we go, you know, the celebrations and rituals around food are vitally important. Um, and they're, they're leveling, and they are, again, a kind of rocket fuel for social change. Uh, yes, madam. Uh, 
Um, so the, the, if, 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 if wishes were horses, uh, no, I mean, if, if I were, if, 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 if money were no problem, if gender inequality were no problem, what would the food system look like? I mean, I would love to live in that world, but I, 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 I think if, if we look at the way the food system needs to be from a climate change perspective, for example, um, then there is a terrific report uh, called the International Agricultural Assessment on Knowledge, Science, and Technology for Development, IAASTD. Um, it, it's, uh, it's done by a bunch of people who never went to acronym school, but, but it's, uh, it, 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 and this is an international uh, report that's done by the world's top sort of agronomists and soil scientists and rural sociologists. And, and what, what they say is, look, in the future, if we are to, to avoid the perils of climate change, and we're going to move away from fossil fuel dependent agriculture, uh, and if we are going to make sure that everyone in cities, and we are more an urban than a rural uh, planet now, if everyone in cities uh, is, is going to eat properly, then what we'll need is more urban and peri-urban farming. So we'll need more, you know, more green in our cities and, uh, and in and around our cities. So we need much less uh, you know, relying on food being flown from halfway around the world. Also much less uh, you know, farming that involves uh, monoculture. We're, we're thinking about polycultures here. Uh, an example of that would be um, you know, uh, urban Cuba. 70% uh, of the uh, fresh fruits and vegetables eaten in Havana come from Havana. Um, and that, that model, I think, is, is an interesting one for what, it's, what it says about uh, how to grow food. But also, Cuba's, I mean, Havana's very interesting because uh, while there is poverty, uh, they've, they've severed the link between poverty and hunger. Um, there is poverty in, in Cuba, no doubt. But hunger there isn't. There's obesity. Uh, and uh, the, there's you know, marketing of, of junk food, uh, but no one, uh, at least in, in, in the research that I've done and in the travels I've done, I've, no one I know, even particularly in rural areas, was going hungry. Um, the, the, as I say, the, the, I mean, the, the poverty, I mean, no, no one was driving around in a Bentley, um, but you know, no, no one was getting rich from agriculture, but no one was poor. And I think the, the, the kind of agriculture that I saw in Cuba was also very interesting for, for, for precisely being climate change ready. Um, because there was the, you know, what we're used to in industrial monoculture, the, the agriculture we have at the moment is monoculture, you know, one tree, one tree, one tree, one tree. And there was a, a, a sort of tragic natural experiment that happened in Cuba a few years ago when Hurricane, well, it, it was, this was in Nicaragua, uh, where there was an agroecological system, no, it was Cuba, an agroecological system and a monoculture. And in the agroecological system, uh, the Hurricane Mitch tore through and some of the trees went down, but they were able to save some of the trees and uh, you know, th there was ground cover that, that did much better. If the trees couldn't be saved, then at least the canopy w w was open and the ground cover crops did well. So you had this really complex ecosystem. Whereas the monoculture, you know, the trees fell over, a couple were saved, and the rest of them died. And so because you know, this hurricane leveled everything fairly, you know, in a fairly egalitarian way, um, but agroecological farms were up and running 60 days, well, between 60 and 90 days before uh, monoculture farms. In other words, you, know, you, have, you have this amazing farming system. We know that the weather's going to change. We know that there are going to be much more extreme weather events. Here's a farming system that's back on its feet fully three months before the kind of farming that we do at the moment. Uh, and that sort of agriculture, I think, is the stuff that, that we need to be paying attention to. So while you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm no defender of Cuba, particularly not Cuban food, which is among the, the worst food I've ever had, um, I, I think there's something very interesting about Cuban agriculture, particularly the mix of urban and uh, rural and the entitlement system and uh, the agroecological sciences that are happening there. I mean, it's not all sweetness and light uh, because Hugo Chavez is sending fossil fuels over to Cuba, so he's, he's pushing an, uh, a, 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 a sort of counter-revolution to this agroecological change. But I, I still think that there's some really interesting stuff happening in Cuba. And I, I think you know, the, the, the future of the food system has to be much more regional. You know, it means eating more with the seasons, uh, eating... You know, I mean, what, what, the, the modern industrial agricultural system has taken from us the sense of not only where we are, because the food comes from everywhere, but also when we are. Right? We, we have no sense of when in the year we are right now. If, if there are tomatoes there, it's tomatoes because you know, these, these sort of red balls of mostly water are there most of the year round. We have no sense of when in the year we are. Um, a future agricultural system is also going to connect us much more with our time and place, and that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, sir? Yeah, yeah well, we're seeing a lot of potential in sustainable agriculture for carbon storage sequestration, uh, carbon sink. But you know, there's a lot of 
discussion around what sort of, whether we're going to get a carbon market or cap and trade. Mm. And there's a lot of worry about how such a thing, when it's implemented, is it going to have a bias towards the big outfits. Yeah. Um, so the, the question is, there is a lot of uh, potential in sustainable agriculture around uh, carbon sequestration. And, uh, but th there's also worry now about you know, whether we're going to get a carbon market or cap and trade or what, you know, what the hell's going on. And uh, won't that be, if there is a carbon market, won't it inevitably favor the rich and the powerful? Uh, and the answer is carbon markets always favor the rich and the powerful. And if you look at the, the European carbon market, which recently collapsed, um, that uh, you know, it, it collapsed in part because permits were given away to the most powerful polluters. And then you know, th 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 there's been no sort of drive to actually shift away from pollution. There's just been a license to pollute. So I think carbon markets have demonstrably been a failure. Um, I, I think that there's something, uh, that there is merit in a carbon tax um, in other words, to, uh, to, to challenge, to, to, to level the playing field so that sustainable agriculture is doing the right thing by default. Uh, but when you know, industrial agriculture is doing something very, very unsustainable, it shouldn't be allowed to do that for free. There should be a tax on, on, on the way that they, that they farm. So all of a sudden, what looks like uh, you know, cheap food, which is you know, the, the solution to everything we are told these days. You know, the, the, the way to solve poverty is by having cheap food. The way to uh, make sure that every American eats is to have cheap food. We have some of the cheapest food on earth, and that's, you know, it's, we still have 50 million people who are food insecure. The problem is not that our food is insufficiently cheap. It's because our poorest people are way too poor. And the way you fix that is by getting, you know, understanding the environmental problem as a problem of uh, the, the, you know, the cheap food complex, but also understanding that the reason we have so much poverty in this country is because you know, cheap food and cheap gas have been the cor corollary of low wages. So if we're interested in a sustainable environmental solution, we also need to raise wages in this country. Um, so I think that you know, if we were talking seriously about an environmental fix, then certainly sustainable farming, which is always more expensive, uh, needs to be the norm. But also, in order for sustainable farming to, to, to work and to feed everyone, people need to be richer. And every American, uh, you know, the, the minimum wage obviously needs to be a living wage. Uh, but we need to be moving beyond that towards uh, eradicating poverty altogether. And that's an environmental solution to, I mean, the, uh, eradicating poverty is the way to an environmental, uh, environmentally sound future. What, one more question. And I, 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 I'm going, I'm alternating with the gender. So, madam. You, Um, if I understand that question right, and it's a very sophisticated question, I, I, and so I'm, I'm no, but I, and I feel like that there's what I'm hearing is it, it's a question about how we move away. From, if we if we are to develop new you know cultures of food, how do we do that in a in a world where the old culture is still hitting us over the head? Uh, and is, is that is that is that is that one way of, of phrasing of phrasing the question? Um, because that's something I think we, we can do something about. And one of the stories we're following in India is about how people are um, pushing back on food marketing. Uh, you know, the, 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 there's, a, there's a couple who have essentially, sort of, through their judicial action, ended the marketing of junk food in high schools. Um, and through their work, they make you know, Mayor Bloomberg look like an amateur. Um, and, and I think that actually that's important. Uh, because if, if we are to have the freedom to embrace new food cultures, then we need to, to push back on the marketing of food as, as it currently happens. Uh, and we need to stop the marketing of food, particularly to children. Uh, and th this is a point I was making earlier on today as well, but I, I think it's so important, it's worth saying again. Um, we, what is marketing? Marketing is, in, the, you know, in economics, it's about information. The reason we allow marketing is because, you know, basically, you are a rational economic agent. You need information to be able to make your decision about whether you would want Coke or Coke Light or Coke Diet. Why are there two kinds of Diet Coke? 
like two kinds of zero calories. Does any, I, this is a serious question. I, 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 this came up earlier on today. Why are there two different kinds of the same zero calorie coke? Does anyone know? Oh, very good. Oh, that's fantastic. Genius. Okay, good. Uh, so, so, but, but, you know, uh, so, so, but, but this kind of marketing, right, uh, uh, of, of um, uh, d different kinds of, you know, different kinds of you know, varieties of Coke and Pepsi, uh, that's, that kind of marketing needs, is about providing information, allegedly. But children are not rational consumers who need information. Because you know, we, we all agree that it's a bad idea in general to let kids you know, have guns. Uh, or you know to vote or to drink in general, uh, and uh, and so and yet it's okay all of a sudden to market food to them. Well, no. I mean, uh, so one of the interesting things that, that, that I think is a, 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 a point where we get to push back against food corporations is the way that their marketing affects children. Um, and you know, Ronald McDonald, for example, um, you know, obviously a character aimed at children, right? I mean, I don't, I don't know any adults whose, influence, you know, whose decisions are influenced by the antics of a clown. Not many. Uh, but but, but, but you know, you know, this clown clearly designed to, to, to sort of push uh, information or you know, to be able to seduce children into, into, into desiring these products. So, I mean, I think part of the, 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 the you know, sustainable food revolution is stopping all this, uh, all this marketing. Now, the corporations will say, as they do, do in San Francisco, we had, we, had a, a funny, we had a funny case in San Francisco where uh, the tobacco companies um, took, us, took San Francisco to court. So there was a law passed in San Francisco about um, banning the sale of cigarettes in pharmacies. Um, because you know the thinking being, if you're going into a pharmacy, you want things to help keep you alive, and cigarettes don't, don't fall into that category. Uh, and and so and, and, and the pharmacies fought back, and they said, no, 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 we, we have to sell cigarettes because that way we can counsel people who come in to buy nicotine patches instead. Uh, and and but the tobacco companies filed a brief saying, no, 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 screw all that. This is about free speech. We need to be able to sell our um, our, our product uh, as a matter of free speech in, uh, in in pharmacies. And the judge struck that down and said, no, no, no. Free speech is fine, but you're not speaking about cigarettes. You're selling cigarettes, and it's okay for us to ban the marketing of cigarettes. But this idea of, of corporate free speech is very, very powerful, and uh, and it's it's also sold to us as a liberty argument, and that's uh, that, that I think is a very powerful argument. Uh, the idea that uh, you know I don't want bureaucrats telling me what to do. I need to be free as a consumer. And Mayor Bloomberg's example, you know, in New York about the 16 ounce soda. Do you know, do you know the story? I mean, you know, basically, Mayor Bloomberg in, in New York has banned the sale of soda in quantities more than 16 ounces, um, and you know, the, the food industry is up in arms. Uh, and and of course, you know, he, he's not saying. You know, you, you, you can't consume, I mean, if you want to consume a quantity of soda the size of your head, you can. You just have to suffer the indignity of buying 16, 16 ounce soda. Uh, but, but, you know, no one's stopping you doing that. But what's interesting is that the food industry is pushing back by saying, look, this is an infringement on our liberty, on our freedom. I don't want bureaucrats telling me what to do. But the, you know, the, the way to flip that back is, look, as a parent, I want to take, I, I, I buy your individual responsibility argument. I must take responsibility for my kid. Uh, but then let me do that. Uh, and I can't take responsibility for my kid where every dollar that's spent marketing something that's good for my kid uh, is counted by $500 marketing stuff that will give my kid diabetes or heart disease. Uh, so in order for me to have my freedom, corporations need to have less freedom. And that's okay. It's okay for it to be a zero-sum game, and it's okay for me to be free while corporations have their hands tied. And being able to push back in that way seems to me to be able to, to, to get to some of the, some of the richness of, the, of your question, which is, if we are going to have a sustainable food system, then it means actually organizing to stop the food system we have at the moment. It's to get these corporations out of the picture, to, to, to tamp their voices down, uh, and to, you know, whether we're talking about ending corporate personhood or just you know, limiting their, 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 their personhood rights to free speech, all of these things need to happen. Uh, because a democracy can't function when we treat corporations as, as natural people. Uh, and I think if we're interested in, in taking on this idea of building a new food culture, then it's okay to silence the old, fo old food culture, because we already know that it's killing our kids and it's shortening our life expectancies. And those are two very good reasons, if, if any other others were needed, to be able to shut them up so that we can let our food culture flourish. Thank you. I want to let you know that Raj has agreed to stick around for a while. We'll probably be out in the lobby.
If you brought a copy of his book, Stuffed and Starved, or even his New York Times bestseller, The Value of Nothing, uh, he's agreed to sign that book. Uh, uh, please uh, keep in mind that he's got a very, very early flight to Edmonton tomorrow for his next engagement, so uh, uh, please respect uh, his time as we head out to the lobby. Uh, <laughs> and respect mine because I have to drive. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we want to make a special presentation to Raj here, uh, as we have done in a tradition of our Global Fest keynote speakers because of their global service. And Raj uh, has certainly done a lot in the areas that he's talked about tonight. And we want to acknowledge and recognize his contributions with our Global Service Award. And the Global Service Award uh, is in this box. And I'm not going to show it to you because it's crystal, it's a globe on a base, yeah. you just have to trust me on that. <laughs> uh, but if I get it out, I'm going to drop it, I don't want to do that. So uh, I'll just read you what's the inscription on the, uh, the award. Global Fest 2013 Global Service Awards, Awards set at LA College. Awarded to Raj Chappelle for his untiring dedication to creating a more sustainable, just, and healthy world food system. Raj, thank you. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you. 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 Thank